Hey, Irish fans. Welcome to Football Friday's Chalk Talk with Bill and Bill. My name is Mike Sullivan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association, and we are very pleased to bring you this popular segment of Football Fridays this year in a virtual setting. If you've never seen Chalk Talk with Bill and Bill, let me give you an idea of what you can expect over the next 60 minutes. Bill and Bill, that's Coach Bill Lewis and Coach Bill Reagan, collectively bring over 60 years of college and professional football expertise to you today to break down the matchup between Notre Dame and Duke. Coach Bill Reagan will start things off with an overview of the game and a little uh, historical significance uh, for this week's matchup, as well as a look at Duke's defense and the challenges they'll bring to the Notre Dame offense. Coach Bill Reagan was formerly the uh, director of football operations under Ty Willingham and previously served as head football coach at St. Joe College in Rensselaer, Indiana. Following Coach Bill Reagan, you'll enjoy Coach Bill Lewis. Now, Bill Lewis was the defensive backs coach under Charlie Weiss here at Notre Dame, but has made stops along the way all over college and professional football, serving as head coach at Georgia Tech, East Carolina, and uh, Wyoming. Professionally, was a defensive backs coach for the Miami Dolphins under Jimmy Johnson, but really a true legend in the game. And he will analyze the challenges that Duke's offense will bring to the Notre Dame defense. Uh, so sit back and enjoy. Uh, after Coach Bill and Bill each do their segment, we'll come together for some keys to the game. So at this point, we'll turn it over to Coach Bill Reagan. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And a big hello to our Bill and Bill fans, who uh, hopefully there is a much larger crowd out there now as we're coming to you digitally for the first time. And, uh, and some of you may have been following us for a few years. Some of you may be brand new to this experience. Uh, but hello and welcome. And, uh, you know, who would have thought that uh, not only would we be doing this presentation virtually, but we've all had to learn a, a lot of new things. And uh, one of the ways I had to do it was learn how to train quarterbacks from my desk chair. You can see me back here in uh, April or March um, for the first time virtually doing this with, uh, with quarterbacks is something I've been doing since I retired. Uh, and uh, I handled almost half of my training in a virtual capacity since then. So we've, we've all learned to adjust. And uh, for those not familiar with our show, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. So uh, I'm going to go through Duke from a defensive perspective, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I'm also going to give you some background as to the Duke Notre Dame history. And we don't have a lot of history with Duke, but there is some other history I'd like to talk to you about. And hopefully you'll find that interesting as well. Um, and then I will turn um, the show over to Bill Lewis and he'll talk to you about Duke's offense. Cause we really want to give you a perspective of what our opponent is like. I think most of you, who follow Notre Dame seriously have a pretty good idea what Notre Dame is all about and, and the kind of things they like to do. So we'd like to show you a little bit more um, of what the opponent is like, okay? So uh, with that, I'm gonna get into some news notes and nuggets, uh, things dealing with the game today uh, and, excuse me, tomorrow and then, uh, and then I'll get into their uh, defense. But there's a lot of background here. So first of all, I'd like to tell a little bit, Bill and I are in our starting our 12th year of Chalk Talk. And I have to tell you, it's something that we're very proud of. Uh, we're kind of surprised when I actually figured out the other day how many years it had been. But we started out doing this for small groups of donors uh, on behalf of Kevin White, who was the our athletic director then, ironically now is the uh, vice president and uh, athletic director at Duke. What Kevin wanted us to do was talk to small groups of donors uh, just a couple hours before the game in the locker room at, uh, at Notre Dame. And so we would do this for home games. We're very happy to announce that this year we're gonna attempt uh, the Chalk, Bill and Bill Chalk Talk for every game of the year. And uh, Mike may have already said that to you. So it's our 12th year. And we did this, as I mentioned, for small groups of donors. We did this for corporate sponsors. 
We've done it for uh, large groups over in the ballroom at the Morris Inn. And uh, it, it's been a fantastic um, opportunity that we took upon ourselves to get to uh, the folks out around there. You know, then we retired and uh, we, we kind of did it ourselves. Legends hosted us. And for a couple of years, we did it that way. And then Mike Sullivan called us. He said, hey, how would you like to be a part of Football Fridays? Do your presentation. And we thought that was just awesome. And uh, so really happy to uh, get that going and be a part of the new virtual Bill and Bill Chalk Talk series. So a little deeper into the background of what's happening tomorrow. Um, this is not the first time Notre Dame has forged ahead with football during a pandemic. And that's something I want to take a little closer look at just to give you guys kind of a perspective for uh, what has happened a little over 100 years ago. So Notre Dame, the pandemic, and football. In March of 1918, Newt Rockney gets hired as the head football coach and athletic director for the University of Notre Dame. And what an exciting time that must have been for Rockney. Um, you know, he's... Uh, been a head coach, a little bit as the track coach at Notre Dame. He's been an assistant coach and a player for Notre Dame. Now he's going to be the head coach at his alma mater at just 30 years of age, raising a young family in South Bend, Indiana. So he knew this was going to be challenging right off the bat. World War II was raging over in Europe and it was just getting to the point where uh, US, the U.S. is getting involved and now he's going to be losing a lot of players who are signing up. Um, so September of that year, because of World War I complications, World War I, not World War II, World War I is raging overseas. And as I mentioned, a lot of college age guys are signing up and enlisting to go fight in the war. So he's losing guys, and they're hoping to kind of replace a lot of these guys with a program called the Student Army Training Corps. This SATC program was being held at several universities around the country, and guys could go there and be trained for the Army while still taking classes. And this would allow them to play for the school they were at. So. Unfortunately, early in the year, they were having problems with their local uh, enlistment boards and paperwork was slow. And so these guys weren't necessarily there in September. So there were also travel restrictions. The government had asked all groups of people not to travel long distances. So teams started canceling games left and right. Um, and in September of that year, they were only able to play one game in which they went to Cleveland and beat Case Tech. In Indiana, the worst of the pandemic occurred in October. And this was heightening this already challenging football season for Newt Rockney. October 11th, their order was issued forbidding all public gatherings until further notice. This shutdown would continue until November 9th. In fact, even during the shutdown, and I don't know what communications was like back then, but the Great Lakes Naval Station, who has already had a game scheduled for October 19th, shows up at Notre Dame to play a game, only to be told they have to turn around and go back. And Rockney during this time was hoping he could schedule as many uh, military or naval outlets to come to campus and, because they could travel. So he was hoping that they could travel to Notre Dame, but because of the county ban on travel, they ironically sent them back to, uh, to Chicago and uh, did a return trip on November 9th and played. The October games were either canceled or rescheduled because of the pandemic now getting worse. And uh, the hope was that Rockney could reschedule these games or schedule some other opponent uh, to come in November when he hopefully would have that ban lifted, that travel ban as well as the local ban for gathering in large groups. 
Uh, and he was able to do this, got five games in the month of November. There happened to be five Saturdays that year in November, and he got them all in. Classes were canceled from October 11th and resumed October 28th. During the month of October, four Notre Dame students died. You can imagine what a, a, a big deal that would be today, uh, the hysteria that that would cause. And they tried to take it in stride back then. No one tried to to get too alarmed by this, even though people were dying. And of course, as we know, over 600,000 people just in the U.S. ended up passing away because of uh, uh, the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, Notre Dame tied Nebraska on November 28th, to complete a 3-1-2 and two season. Uh, I'm sure this is one that Rockney, with all his challenges and, uh, and still hoping to play, the, the game of football that he so loved and, and hopefully maybe make it as a distraction for guys back then, um, you know, kind of couldn't wait to get this season over with. And in fact, the next season went nine and zero for his first undefeated season. Um, during the pandemic, a, a couple scenes from back then, this, uh, the one on your left is uh, on campus at Notre Dame where they're treating students in probably a makeshift health center. The picture on your right uh, was not from Notre Dame, but from, a, from an athletic event where people were being told back then by the health departments, three things, keep your hands clean, wear a mask, and socially stay away from each other. Now, I don't see any social distancing going on here, but to a person, you can see that they're wearing masks. And certainly Coach Rockney, uh, to set a good example, had his own mask that I'm sure he wore back in those days and uh, had his players wearing masks wherever and whenever possible as well, at least through that really tragic month of uh, October. A few more news notes and nuggets. So at this week's crowd, stadium crowd limited to 15,525, this will be the smallest Notre Dame Stadium crowd since the 1937 opener with Drake, in which the crowd then was 14,955. Only about 500 uh, different in that stadium in that day. And that was the new Notre Dame Stadium. You remember it opened in 1930. So that was a pretty small crowd for an opening game uh, in 1937. Notre Dame, for the first time in their 133 football year history, will have a new goal, to win a conference title. And of course, as you are familiar with uh, Notre Dame, they are now going to be part of the ACC for at least one year. And it, this, the ACC will also not have two divisions this year. So they don't have to win a division, uh, but there will be one conference, and a, and a title to be won, uh, separate from a, a national title. Since 2014, you know, Notre Dame has had this agreement with the ACC to play a block of games every year. And in that uh, time, they have gone 23 and seven against AC, the ACC during the regular season. We of course, also had that game against uh, Clemson where they got beat. Um, Duke owns one of those seven wins. And in fact, uh, Notre Dame, I think, is 14 and one in home games during that period. And Duke would have the only uh, Notre Dame home game uh, victory or loss put on Notre Dame. The Irish overall, though, are four and two versus Duke. Notre Dame is tied for the fourth longest home winning streak in the nation at 18. Only Clemson, Ohio State, and Central Florida have more consecutive home games. So this is a streak. Notre Dame will continue to further. They'd have several home games this year, and hopefully they get them in and can uh, maybe end up uh, topping Ohio State since they won't play this year and, uh, and get over the top in that uh, record. Uh, Ian Book only had six interceptions all of last year. Unfortunately, two of them were against Duke. Notre Dame's last loss, to open a season came in 2011 against South Florida. And as most of you know, South Florida will be the opponent next week. 
So Duke, news knows some nuggets from the Duke camp. Duke opens up as a 20-point underdog. Uh, this is kind of tricky in first games because you really don't know what people have and how they're going to play and uh, how they'll come together. Duke had a very disappointing season last year, but they got a lot of guys back and uh, could be a surprise in the ACC. Duke has gone nine and three in season openers under coach David Cutcliffe. And we'll talk more about coach Cutcliffe in a minute. Duke has beaten five nationally ranked opponents since coach Cutcliffe has been the head coach. Duke will have several 50 year seniors playing who were at Notre Dame stadium in 2016 for their 38 35 victory over Notre Dame. Duke was originally scheduled to play Notre Dame on November 9th, obviously with all the scheduled changes, not unlike 1918, what Rockney went through. Uh, they ended up uh, rescheduling these ACC games and adding Notre Dame to a full schedule. Uh, the ACC has is, is got a very big schedule of, of other ACC opponents, but that switched the game to the opener for Duke. And while Coach Cutcliffe, kind of laments that in public, I think he's probably got to see a real good opportunity here to surprise Notre Dame in the first game of the year. Trouble if it's a shootout for Notre Dame. In Notre Dame's four wins against Duke, they only gave up five points per game. But in two losses, surrendered 37 and 38 points. So if it's a shootout, should Notre Dame be worried? This year, four Duke players have opted out of playing due to COVID-19 concerns. Uh, you know, this is something that's happened all across the country. And certainly every young man has a right to make up his own decision. It just happens that Duke has four that have opted out, one of them being a linebacker with some great playing potential uh, this year. It would have been a starter. They've also lost four others to season-ending injuries, including their starting center. Um, Number 85, though, Damon Filiaw Johnson is a record-setting return man for them. So uh, when number 85 is back there on returns, uh, keep your eyes open. Don't, don't go to the concession stand in your house uh, until he's taken to the ground. So let's talk a little bit about Coach Cutcliffe, i.e. the savior. I want to tell you how much he's done for football at Duke. So the Blue Devils had won just 10 games in the previous eight seasons to Coach Cutcliffe arriving. From 2004 to 2007, Duke lost by three touchdowns, at least three touchdowns, on 22 occasions. His 67 victories in 11 years are 48 more than the previous 11 seasons. The last seven years, 52 victories, six bowl appearances, three bowl victories, and an ACC Coastal Division Championship. 2012 ended an 18-year bowl drought. He had the program's first bowl victory since 1961. He's had three consecutive bowl victories for the first time in the program's history. He had an eight-game winning streak in 2013, which was Duke's longest since 1941. He had Duke's first showing in the final poll since 1962. And for the first time since 1971, had two wins over nationally ranked opponents. 2013, he was National Coach of the Year. All right, so let's take a little bit of look at the Duke defense. We know Coach Cutcliffe can coach. We know he's gonna do a great job. But what about this defense? They've kind of been the strongest point of the Duke football team under Coach Cutcliffe. And ironically, he's an offensive guy. But he's been smart enough to make sure that Duke plays good defense because you just can't win without good defense. They employ a 4-2-5 defensive scheme. They, um, Sometimes we'll play a three, three, five scheme. And what that means is so in their four, two, five, they're going to have four down linemen, 
only two linebackers, and they're going to play five defensive backs the majority of the time. As offenses are in this day and age playing spread, uh, spreading it out, they, they want to have five defensive backs on the field. They have co-defensive coordinators, a defensive line coach, and one of their secondary coaches are their defensive coordinators. They've been doing this for a couple of years. So they are obviously work, used to working together on this. Duke had 35 sacks in 2019, which is a 10-year high for the Blue Devils. So they're, they're able to get after you. The front four are veterans and are the strength of the defense. They're, no question. Uh, they've got four guys there that have been playing together for about three years. They are very physical, tough, and I'm going to talk more about two of those guys in a minute. Next, though, is the secondary. The secondary was 24th in the nation last year in pass defense. Um, so they got a good core back there, and they're, uh, they have a lot of veterans. So they're, they're, they have more depth in the secondary than any other place on their defense. Because in the front seven, depth could be an issue. One thing Coach Cutcliffe said last year is we probably didn't rest guys enough, played our front four too much. And uh, I, so I think you'll see a lot of guys playing in the front seven, but by no means the strength is still that front four. Number 28, uh, Mark Gilbert returns after two years. He's a defensive back, a cornerback. He's won the starting position after two years away. And he had a real tragic injury after being an outstanding defensive back as a sophomore. He was already an NFL prospect. He was uh, uh, all ACC, uh, led the nation with uh, passes defended, and he was second in the nation with interceptions. The start of 2018, he had a very tragic hip injury, uh, which caused him to miss the rest of uh, 2018 as well as 2019. So it's a great feel good story. Watch number 28 and see how fully he does, how fully he's returned to his original capacity. They think he looks great. They think he's playing really well. And the secondary also has a transfer from Michigan, Jamarcus Wood, Jamaric Woods, who's expected to compete at the Rover safety position. I can tell you he'll be the second one in, uh, in the game tomorrow. So, Back to the front four and two guys to really watch. Uh, number 96, Chris Rumpf, the second. Uh, he had last year 47 tackles, 13 and a half tackles for loss, six and a half sacks and 11 hurries. This guy puts pressure on. He did not even start for Duke last year except for one ball game. So he may not even start Saturday. They do like to move him around. He's listed as a defensive end. He plays primarily on the left side of their defensive line at defensive end. He's long, he's lean, and he gets upfield in a hurry. He's got a great swim technique, which is a punch with a swim over the top, and a nice, nice player. Uh, so keep your eye on number 96. The other guy's been kind of the stalwart of their defense, is the other guy to watch and the other defensive end is number 51, Victor Demukeji. Second team all ACC a year ago had, has had 38 starts and led the team with eight and a half sacks last year. So keep your eye on him. He's a great defensive player. And those two guys will, will pose a real threat, okay? Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn my – the, my, my portion, I'm done with my portion of the program. I'd like to turn the program over to Bill Lewis now. Uh, those of you who have watched Bill in the past know he is really going to get into it with our offense and, uh, and tell you a little bit more about Coach Cutcliffe's side of things on the offensive side of the ball. I'll see you a bit l later for our keys to the game. All right, here we go. I'd like to join... Mike and Bill in welcoming all of you, old and new, to 2020 uh, version of Chalk Talk. As in the past, I'll be responsible for pre presenting the opposing team's offense. And as you look at this, the very first decision that the offensive play caller must make in his play calling is to determine what personnel grouping he wants on the field. 
but personnel grouping, I'm talking about what running backs, tight ends, and wide receivers does he want on the field. We know that in every formation, you're going to have an offensive center, you're going to have two guards, and you're going to have two tackles. So the system that is used is a two-digit system, which is going to tell you how many running backs and how many tight ends are on the field. And what you do is you add, do a quick addition and then determine how many wide receivers need to be added to that number to bring it to five. And so with 11 personnel, you're going to have first digit tells us one running back, second digit tells us one tight end, and then we add those two together. One and one is two, so we uh, obviously to get the five, we have to add the three wide receivers. If we go to 10 personnel, first digit, one running back, second digit, there's no tight end on the field, so we would then have four wide receivers. And in all these alignments, the quarterback can be in the, the pistol or the other alignments that I'll discuss with you that he might be lined up in. Now, just look into the two other uh, personnel groupings where the backfield might be empty. No one is in the backfield except the quarterback. So if we had 0-1 personnel, we would have no running backs on the field. We would have one tight end on the field and the four wide receivers. If we went to double zero personnel, we would have no running back. We would have no tight end on the field. And all five of these people would be wide receivers. Just a quick look at the quarterback positions. If I refer to the quarterback as being under center, that means he's in the old time position of taking the snap directly uh, from the offensive center. If we go to the shotgun situation, we're now talking about the quarterback being approximately four and a half to five yards uh, from the offensive center. And then the running back, if we refer to it as shotgun, the running back is lined up on one side or the other of the quarterback. A popular formation now, and I think we might see a good amount of this from the Duke team, is pistol situation. The quarterback is then lined up four and a half to five yards, again, as he is in the shotgun. But now the running back, instead of being off to the side, is directly behind him. And you see by these arrows, it now gives you an opportunity to run the identical plays to either side with him in that neutral position. The last position that is sometimes used in critical third down situations on the goal line is what we call wildcat. Wildcat simply means that the quarterback is going to go away from the center position and they'll replace him with either a running back or a wide receiver. This is a situation where they want to definitely have the ball in the hands of the running back right now as opposed to having it in the hands of the quarterback. What's that old saying? A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to Duke's uh, first four games. Before COVID-19, Duke was scheduled to play their first three games against Middle Tennessee, Elon, and Charlotte, all three at home. And three opponents that on paper you would think, hey, Duke's got a pretty good opportunity to win those games. And then their fourth game was going to be their ACC opener at Pitt. Along comes covid and what happens to the Duke schedule? It now becomes all four of those games are going to be ACC opponents. And the first one is here in a, a day or so, their opener against Notre Dame on the road. And so uh, as you go back to what they were planning back in January and February and what they were planning here in June, July, August, and September, a big change in what the Duke football team is going to be faced with. Let's take a breath right here and evaluate what this report is based on. And the first thing we, we know is that it's based on last year's, as far as looking at these players playing, it's based on last year's Duke offense. So there's a lot of guessing is what might uh, occur. As we look back, and these things could very definitely influence uh, what uh, they want to do with their offense. They lost five of their last six games. They were outscored in those games 210 points to 98 points. So there's got to be a lot of evaluation about that. During their last five games, their quarterback was sacked 28 times, which has uh, put their offense in a lot of bad positions in that game. 
They also have, last year they played with a senior quarterback. They're going to have a new starting quarterback, and he transferred from Clemson, and he was not on the Duke campus till sometime late in June. Also, they have a new offensive line coach, and perhaps those uh, 28 sacks had something to do with that. And then last week in practice, they lost their fifth-year starter at the center position to a season-ending knee injury. And he wore number 50. He was a senior by the name of Jack Wallaball. He was 6'4", 205 pounds. Where that will be critical is in all of your drop-back passing game, the center is given the responsibility of telling the rest of the team what protection system are they going to use. So this is going to go to a, some new player uh, playing in that uh, center position. The other kind of grump uh, gathering this whole thing together, how effective have they been able to use the time they had in meetings? Uh, most Division I teams reported back to camp sometime late in June, early July. So as they were going through their preseason conditioning, and then they start their preseason practice time, how effective with all of the other distractions that were coming on, how effective were they able to, to use that time? And as I mentioned, the positive effects of COVID-19 are definitely uh, involved here. The other thing, and perhaps the biggest of all, is that their head football coach, David Cutcliffe, has announced that he has taken over as the offensive coordinator and the play caller. In his press conferences, he mentioned in several different times he was meeting with the press that they want to throw the ball downfield. Why do they want to do that? To loosen up the defense, get them from stacking uh, the line of scrimmage so we can, we can look to that. And, uh, you know, this guy who's talking to you right now, I want to let you know he's old school. Uh, he does everything by hand. That's the way he learned it uh, back uh, for the 1963 football season. Uh, also, he's got uh, – uses reference to tendencies, not the fa fancy word of analytics. And there's a possibility that somewhere along the line, he might even misspell some of these words. Since this is the first game of the 2020 season, there are no 2020 stats. But what I'd like to do, Duke has a lot of returning players at the critical positions on offense from a stat standpoint. And I'd like to quickly show you uh, who they are and what they did. When we look at the running game from last year, their two starting running backs are returning which is a big plus for the offense. Together, they uh, rushed for over 1,000 yards. Their yards per carry, uh, not bad, kind of in that good area. You'd like to maybe see it over five-point yards per carry. The one thing that needs to be added to these two is last year, their starting quarterback rushed 160 times, which is second only to, to Jackson, and he had 510 yards, which, he, again, so that's been missing. How are they going to replace or attempt to replace those yards. When we look at their passing stats, their last year quarterback threw for 2,078 yards, 16 touchdowns. He also had 11 interceptions, which needs to be better. But of the returning quarterbacks, there were only 13 attempts uh, during the entire season with three completions. So uh, the quarterback position is gonna be starting uh, all over again as we go into this season. As I jump down, I want to open this complete group up. They've got a lot of strength in their returning receivers. So I mentioned uh, both returning running backs coming back, a lot of uh, production from their receivers coming back. And the one guy I want to point out, uh, first of all, is their tight end, number 87, Gray. I think he's the best athlete on their whole offensive unit. He's a 6'5", 235, 240-pound tight end. He led the team in receptions with 51. Now, one of the things you might notice with him is his yards per reception, 7.7. .7. So he was basically used, and I'm going to show you, he was basically used on first down or in that third down and four, five, six, seven yards to go. The other thing I notice is their production per reception of their wide receivers and running backs uh, was rather low. There are a couple of receivers that didn't have the number of catches but had you like to see yards per catch somewhere tell 12 yards per reception or higher so you had a couple receivers here a wide receiver here 
that accomplished those numbers. Now let's get into the bulk of what we are going to guess Duke will be doing with their offense. The quarterback that transferred from Clemson, uh, I don't believe he is going to be the runner that they had at that position last year. So I think they're going to build their offense around the outside zone play. It is not the zone read option. We're going to start talking about that next week. So don't confuse this uh, offense with that. All right. And what we've got in the outside zone play or the stretch play, as some people refer to it, it's a zone scheme of blocking. What does that mean? A zone scheme means that we're not going to block a man. We're going to block a zone. And so all of these people are going to step to the side of the play. All right. And then from that position, they are simply going to work upfield and block whoever shows in that zone all the way across the line of scrimmage. All right. Now, the quarterback can take the ball from under center or in the pistol. The running back in the, both those situations will be right behind him. All right. And what he is going to do is he's going to aim at the outside leg of the offensive tackle. And he's going to run a straight line to that point until the quarterback takes and puts the ball and hands it off to him. There's no read. The ball's being given to him. And now what he will do is find the soft spot in that zone block. It could be all the way out on the corner. It could be anywhere along the, along the line of scrimmage. It'll be difficult for him to break way back behind the center, but he could find a soft spot on the backside. All right. And once again, on this, the uh, offensive line are going to take big splits. Now, I mentioned here that the quarterback will uh, pick the direction at the line of scrimmage. So he could take and run that play here. He could call the, the running play, whatever their terminology is, and run the exact same thing here with everybody's own blocking in that way. I've got it drawn against 12 personnel. Uh, that gives gives them an opportunity to run both to both tight ends. They could run it from 11 personnel and run to the tight end in that formation. Now, off of that outside zone, they can run a play action pass. Now, let's uh, start out with the offensive linemen are going to do the same thing as they did in the running play. All right. The quarterback is going to open up from either position. All right. And this running back is going to run exactly as he did on the run play. The quarterback will take the ball from either position and he will come and give a short ride. All right. Now this is referred to as a play action pass. He's made that decision in the huddle. All right. And what he's gotten is he's got some reference from the press box telling him that when we run this play, this linebacker is coming up the field hard and possibly even one of these safeties might be attacking the run. So what they're going to do is they're going to take this, wide receiver here and run him off all right, to clear that zone. And they take that tight end right up and working into this open seam here. Quarterback is a good fake, comes back and hits that tight end. And that's where referencing their tight end, I think they could certainly make use of him. Now also off of this outside running play, we can get a boot pass action. Now I use this term RPO, run pass option. What that means is we're going to communicate with somebody in the press box who's telling us what's happening on the field when we run that outside zone play. So again, we're going to run a boot pass. All right. And I'll describe that to you. And let's start running back comes right here, just like he did. Everything else on the line of scrimmage with the interior five is they're showing you the zone play. The quarterback is going to come out a quick fake and then he's going to bootleg or come back opposite of the flow at the line of scrimmage. What we're going to be able to do now is we're going to be able to create a three level pass for him. We got this guy running a deep takeoff. That's going to be his first look. This tight end is going to start down like he's zone blocking and then work back up into that eight, nine, 10 yard area. And the backside tight end will run a shallow cross route. So as the quarterback comes back, he looks there number one, here, number two, here, number three, the backside receiver will just run some kind of backside route because the ball is generally going to be thrown to one of those three receivers. This, I believe, folks, could be the, one of the main parts of this new Duke offense. Now, I mentioned that we've got a new play caller, the head football coach. 
David Cutcliffe. Dave likes option football. And so we're not going to get into that zone read stuff. I, I don't believe with this quarterback because I don't think he's had enough time to work that in. But what we're going to do is we're going to run a speed option. All right. And I just want to mention here that uh, I'm going to give you an example of before the snap of the ball, a receiver giving us extended motion. All right. And what we're doing there is we're reading particularly the secondary. If somebody runs across the field with motion, it could be a strong indication that they're playing a zone pass coverage. If the secondary and the linebackers simply move without somebody running across the formation, then we can kind of think that they're playing some type of zone coverage. Okay, so they'll, you'll see some of that. It has uh, nothing to do with the actual end play, but it's going to give that quarterback an idea of what kind of coverage they might have. All right, speed option, simple for the quarterback. What we're going to do is everybody on the line of scrimmage blocks the first man on or inside of him. All right. And the quarterback is going to take the snap. It could be under center. It could be here. It could be in the gun. And what he's going to do is he's coming down the line of scrimmage, and he's going to attack the first thing outside of the down block. If that guy takes him, then the running back becomes the pitch man. All right? So he would, as the quarterback starts down the line of scrimmage, he'd be coming here. If this guy takes the quarterback, he pitches it, and the wide receiver would then be blocking the corner who's responsible for the pitch. If this guy comes drifting out here toward the pitch man, then the quarterback would be turning up field. Speed option is an easy play to teach, and it fits the physical size of this quarterback. And I think we could certainly see that become a part of their offense. Now, as we look back toward last year's stats, their wide receivers had some running plays. And the play that falls so easy into that is what we call the jet sweep. And that's a, a ball involving a wide receiver running. All right. Also, the other thing, again, uh, you're going to see shifts in motions to give the quarterback some kind of pre-snap uh, read as far as what kind of coverage. Now, if a player shifts, and I've got this tight end over here, and then he's going to shift to the other side. If he's shifting, he must come to a complete stop if they want to put a guy in motion. So on this particular play, I say, okay, the tight end's going to start here. He's going to shift over here and reset what's done to the secondary. All right? After he's reset, then this guy can come in motion. And what they do with the jet sweep, they time it so that as the ball is snapped, then the quarterback now must be in either the shotgun or the pistol it's timed out, so as soon as he receives the ball, it times out, so this guy's passing in front. He catches the ball and hands it to this guy. Sweep action, easy blocking thing. Everybody's just coming off and trying to work to the corner, all right? And this back is trying to take that ball and get it outside, all right? Again, uh, I want to mention also, also now, off of this, they can fake the, the jet sweep, and off of that, the quarterback can come back and throw then the ball, particularly probably to a wide receiver or something. But you can get play action off of that jet sweep. Now, everything I've mentioned to this point, from the, the, the stretch player outside zone play and uh, all of the speed option and now this jet sweep, everything is off the initial action. That's where the ball is going. So every team is going to have a, a, a complement uh, to their – uh, plays that they previously shown, and this would be a complement to those plays. It's called a counter tray or a counter power play. All right, and what that means is we're going to start action in one direction, which is what all these other plays have been doing, and then we're going to come back and counter back. All right, and on this particular play, the blocking scheme would be I'm going to block inside. All right, so he would end up on that linebacker here, here, here. Any type, anytime you use the word power, it means we're going to block down and someone is going to kick out from inside out the first man outside of the down blocks to create a running seam in that area. All right. And then on this play, we're using the tight end and a lot of people refer to him in that position as the H back because he can do a lot of movement and he can also do a lot of blocking back to the inside. He would then be coming through and blocking up on the first thing that showed inside of that 
trap or kick out block. Now what we've done is we've done the basic play that I described was that stretch play or that outside zone. So the ball comes here, the ball's uh, quarterbacks in the pistol and they start for a step or two this way. Here comes that stretch play. And then the, on that second or third step, he plants his outside foot, quarterback pivots back and he hands the ball on a, what was referred to as a counter power or a counter trade. And I think we'll see that as they develop the basic part of their offense. Now, as we look at the passing game, remember now we've got a new quarterback, we've got a new play caller in their head coach. Now their head coach has been around and he's uh, made a lot of play calls. You know, he had uh, the Manning brothers at the University of Tennessee and the University of Mississippi. So he's been around quarterbacks that know how to throw the ball. But one of the things you want to do at the start of the game, especially the start of this guy's first game, is you want to get him some throws to build his confidence. So some quick, easy throws. So the first thing is, and everybody is running this play, the bubble screen. In college football now, we can throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage. And if it's thrown behind the line of scrimmage, we're allowed to go downfield and block. As an old secondary coach, I don't like that rule, but it's what the offensive teams are taking advantage of. So what we're gonna do on the snap of the ball now the receiver is going to take a couple of steps downfield, like he's pushing downfield, to get these guys to start into their, into their zone coverage, and then he's going to come back into the backfield. We're going to have both those people are going to get blocked downfield while the ball's in the air. This is a great situation for 12 personnel, where you've got two tight ends, two big tight ends. All of a sudden, you've got a 6'5", 240 tight end coming up and blocking that corner. you got this tight end can come in extended motion, all right, snap the ball out here, and he then can come up on either your will linebacker or if you've made a substitute and put a nickel back into the game. Quarterback now, it's a catch and throw. He catches the ball, all right, here he simply catches it, he turns, he throws the ball, high percentage completion, and they've got an opportunity to start to build his confidence. Right along with that, remember back to their last year's stats, who was the leading receiver? their tight end. The best single route that you can give a tight end is what's called the option route, all right? And so what we're gonna do now from either the, uh, the, the pistol or the shotgun, the ball comes in the center, all right? And it's just a quick three-step drop. These people are going to be responsible for softening the area. So he's gonna run a takeoff, all right? These two receivers will be backside because we're coming to this side. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be running some kind of crossing route to get back into the quarterback's vision if his intended receiver gets covered. The tight end now runs. If it's first down, he's coming off the field up into that six to seven yard area. If it's third down, what he's going to do is he's going to know what the yardage is and make sure he gets a yard or two beyond. And what he does is he comes up and he's going to read the person responsible for covering that zone. If this linebacker is inside, what he's going to do is he's going to turn, dip that inside shoulder, kind of push off, and then open up and just run that option route right here. And the rules say he's not supposed to push off, but again, we'll see that uh, where they give that offensive receiver that option. Now, let's say the tight end releases and this linebacker drops to his outside. He just runs the option route. He'll then push into him here and come back inside and the quarterback's throwing the ball there. Again, it's confident throws for the quarterback, all right? And we could get uh, 12 personnel on both sides where he could run a tight end option either way. Now, head coach several times mentions in his uh, visiting with the media, I want to throw the ball downfield. And so let's go back to what people have been doing so much at every level, throwing what we call the back shoulder fade. I'm going to show it to you the old way over here. If I want to throw the outside back shoulder fade to this guy, I'm going to come down. I'm going to release outside of any coverage. If I can, if it's inside, then I already had the outside leverage. And I'm going to run down the field. The quarterback is going to pick a spot and throw the ball outside between you and the sideline. At that point, you're going to turn into your defender, get a little push off, and come and catch the ball here. Now, on this particular diagram, you could 
run out of room. It could be a tight throw for the quarterback, and this receiver might have to get his uh, feet down just inside the boundary to make the catch. So the, the new way, and I saw this on Duke's film last year, what they're doing is they're going to take this receiver, run him down the field, occupy the corner, and then just run a little hitch here. They're now going to take this guy, and he's the one that's going to come down and run the fade off of whatever the coverage is. Now what happens is you've got so much more area for the quarterback to throw the ball. And again, I think this particular concept, I think we're going to see it this Saturday, and I think we're going to see it at multiple Saturdays throughout the season. All right, again, I go back, throw the ball downfield. And everybody who wants to throw the ball downfield has this in their package. They're going to run what we refer to as four verticals, all right? On the run, the inside receivers, this guy here and this guy here, they're going to read the coverage. The outside receivers are told, if you can, widen and get outside, and you're going to run deep takeoffs down just inside the sideline. And whatever coverage is there, they've got to cover it. These two inside receivers are both reading these inside safeties. As they're running down the field, they're reading the inside safeties. They don't care what's happening. Pardon me with the linebackers. If these safeties go back into some type of four cross coverage or two deep coverage, one of these receivers is told, as I read that coverage, I break to the middle of the field somewhere in that 16, 18 yard area. The receiver from the other side, if he reads the same coverage, what he does now is he runs a deep post route right down the middle of the field. Quarterback simply comes back and he reads high to low as far as which coverage. This guy's going to be deeper than the linebackers, and if he runs by these safeties, then the ball's going there. But we will see that because that's something that's in everybody's package. Now, what happens if they go to some type of three deep coverage? This safety now comes down. He's covering the outside third. I like this drawing now. And this guy's working to the middle of the field. And this guy's got the outside third. If that happens, then what happens? These guys both continue right down the seam, right down the seam. These guys are already stretching the field. And you've got a four deep vertical against three deep coverage. And the ball will usually go to the, one of these two guys, the quarterback's best look and getting that ball to that inside receiver. All right, now, last thing in a hurry here. I suspect that somewhere David's gonna have an empty package. Now that can be with any personnel, all right? But nobody is in the backfield, all right? And so what we're gonna do, and you could get zero one personnel, all right? With uh, just four wide receivers and one tight end, or you could get zero zero personnel with five wide receivers. What we're looking for now is what kind of matchups do we have here? If you've got Sam and Will linebackers in the fields working against wide receivers, they could be in trouble. You've got this Mike linebacker, or you possibly can have now, uh, you can go to a 45 defense with an extra uh, nickelback. You could go to 46 defense with a dime, or you could go with 47 defense with a corner, quarter replacing and get all of these uh, – linebackers off the field but that's what we're going to do now they will just determine their matchups and this will be a, just a part of David's passing package of having a combination of routes run against either with either uh, 01 or double zero personnel now along with that you like to have something that can affect them run now you've got a quarterback or you can put your running back back in this position all right. And the best thing to do with this is you got these guys that are so conscious now of the ball being thrown down the field that now show pass action, quarterbacks taking the snap and showing pass and then running a quarterback draw. And this is where these guys would show pass protection and just here and, and the center and this uh, guard would combo here and here. And then one of these two would be up on that linebacker. Quarterback would take two or three steps back and then find a soft spot somewhere uh, to complement. Or they could put a running back back there and do exactly the same thing. Give him some kind of running play, maybe just a quick toss sweep uh, out of that. But somewhere, I think we're going to see empty passing game, and I think we're going to see empty 
uh, some type of empty runs. With that, folks, it's time to throw it back to, to Mike. Well, thanks, Bill. I always feel a lot more anxious about the game after listening to your scattering report. But uh, at this point, let's take a step back, and we're going to review some keys to a Fighting Irish victory on Saturday. So, uh, Bill Lewis, uh, go ahead and begin with uh, keys to victory as you see it. There's always something new for the team, both offense and defense, that your opponent has practiced and so forth. And especially in the first game, and in this game, we've got a new offensive coordinator calling plays, so there might be a lot of new. How quickly can the team recognize what's new and adjust to it on the field? So our, our second key to the game is, uh, I, I termed it a laser focus. And, you know, it's not – it's not unique to want your football team to focus. I think the challenge right now is with so many other distractions that uh, the team that has a better focus stands to have a better chance to win the game. I, I remember marveling back in the 60s. I can go back that far. I don't know if you can, Mike, but I can go back to the 60s. And, and I marvel at the job Eric Parsegian did uh, when there was all the – the unrest in our country at that time and, and, and college students especially were, were, were taking this burden on of, you know, what's the moral compass of our country? What should it be? What, whether it's Vietnam or, or uh, civil rights or what have you and, and navigating through that. And now today we have day-to-day -day uncertainty just with kids on campus, both within their football element and the day-to-day the -day of campus life. It's all different. It's changed. You know, they're going through so much new. You know, the, the landscape is totally unfamiliar. You know, and then countrywide, we have this turmoil again. So, again, I think the football team that can walk in the door and maintain a focus every day they're at practice and, and especially on game day stands to have an advantage. What happens – the first game of the season is you've gone through a series of times during your, your preseason preparation, but it's very difficult in practice to handle the true game tempo. Uh, once that uh, kickoff occurs, uh, the whole tempo of the game speeds up and how quickly can the coaches handle it? How quickly can the play callers handle it? But most important, how quickly uh, can the players handle it? And also then, does the physical part of the game, the substitution, the keep uh, fresh people on the field, uh, all of that comes into that game tempo and being able to properly handle it uh, once they uh, kick it off on Saturday afternoon. Our next key, you heard me reference the, uh, the defensive line for Duke during, the, uh, during my presentation and especially those defensive ends that uh, Duke has. I mean, these guys are pro prospects. And uh, I, I think if we go back and, and evaluate Ian Book's performances from a year ago, he was always better when he had a comfortable pocket. So I see a huge advantage for Notre Dame if they can keep this a uh, safe space for Ian Book. A uh, little bit of a pun on keeping him in his bubble. For those of you who've been reading up on Notre Dame, you know that they're trying to keep him isolated even when he's off the field. So. I want him to feel the same way when he's on the field. Keep him in a nice, peaceful bubble back there and let him execute the passing game. This last one, Yak and Yak, takes me back in time uh, and how old school I am. Back in the uh, 1971 season, I was the secondary coach at Georgia Tech. Our head coach, Bud Carson, put me in charge of this from the defensive side of the ball. They had been doing it apparently – in previous years there. Uh, the first yak is uh, referred to yards after contact on both runs and passes. So what you do is you're looking uh, from an offensive standpoint is how can the, the receiver or the running back break the first contact. From a defensive side, you're looking at how sure are we making the tackle. And as you've watched defensive football here lately, I think we're tackling maybe the worst in the history of the game. So uh, the first part of that yak is we're looking to see uh, what type of 
yardage is there after the first contact on both runs and passes. The second yak refers to passing yards after the catch or yards after the completion. From an offensive standpoint, you're looking for that receiver to make a move, make the first guy uh, miss. From a de defensive standpoint, you're certainly looking for that first contact to get him on the ground. And uh, you've got to, to take those two uh, areas. And at the end of the game, you start to add up how much uh, did you have yards after contact? How much did you have yards after a completion? And it ends up being a big statistic uh, at the end of the football game. Mike, that's it for our keys. We'll turn it back to you at this point. Okay, thanks so much, Bill and Bill. Just a huge uh, heartfelt thanks to both of you for sharing your expertise and your insights with all the learning fans really all over the world here this, uh, this season in this virtual setting. We can't wait to get you back in the Eck Visitor Center on campus. And the same is true for all of you watching uh, across uh, the internet, wherever you might be. We look forward to the day when you're back on campus with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to join us again next Friday at 4.30 Eastern as the Alumni Association again brings you Chalk Talk with Bill and Bill for a breakdown of the matchup with South Florida. Until then, we hope that you celebrate a Notre Dame victory safely, be well, and go Irish. Thanks, everybody.